it's working. Cool. Hi, good, good afternoon for, for all of you. Well, it's nice to be here today. The presentation about using OpenSIPs as a single entry point for a SIP network. It's more or less using OpenSIPs as an SVC. What's called the SVC. Actually, it's very hard to know exactly what is an SVC. Then, when you say SVC, yeah, okay, you put it in front of the SIP servers to basically is something to, to fix the problem with the PB, IP PBXs and soft switches there, there are behind the, the SVC. Uh, but about me, I'm the author of the book Building Telephone Systems with OpenSIPs. I had a book and a partnership in the OpenSIPs training, so we, we did a lot of OpenSIPs training over the last four or five years. And I have a company in Brazil called SIPPOS. We manufacture a soft switch for telcos and VoIP providers. We have more or less 50 customers in Brazil, so we process more than 200 million minutes per month come through for all the customers. And everything started with open simply for frustration. The first project, we, we used to implement Cisco, Cisco routers, and it's it's kind of interesting when you install a Cisco Cisco router, you go there and you configure that in a day. You go to an asterisk, it's a bit different. It takes a week. But when we went to OpenSIPs, it took us three, maybe four months to to deliver the first system. And it, it, it was a very bad one, actually. It, it did what it did, but to make a real OpenSIPs system, it takes a lot of time. Steve is there, probably. How much time did you did you spend building your system? Uh, if I asked you, James, how, how many times did you spend building the Vichidio monster with uh, all those errors? Lost track. Huh? Lost track. <laughs> lost track. Years and years. So it's it's a completely different beast. This thing. You have to spend a lot of time and. With this frustration, we went to, well, let's develop something that we can deliver in one day. So that's what's the idea, I suppose. And now it's a turnkey solution. We, we can actually deliver for wholesale in the same way. One, one car system. That's nice. But today I'm, I'm, I will talk about strategies to protect a SIP network, how to handle SIP on this, on this device, handling internal and external users, how to handle RTP, I will separate how to handle SIP with RTP and the SPC, and extra measures for failure. So, how many of you are still using open SIPs or the gateways in valid IP addresses and publicly, publicly routable addresses? Right? And I have several customers up, up using it, to, <coughs> right? If you go to the soft switch market, most of the people simply say, okay, this is my soft switch, this is the valid IP addresses, this is the IP addresses of the terminations, just send the calls. But the soft switch is completely exposed to, to the internet. And sometimes the whole infrastructure is exposed to the internet. Think of having an SS7 gate <coughs> with 32 E1 connections exposed to the internet. It's really uh, a dangerous thing that you can do, a very, very dangerous thing. Because if this gateway gets invaded, and it will, because all of the systems have some vulnerabilities, you can go to the any of this site, site and you, if you start searching 2014 vulnerabilities, gateways, and phones, you'll find lots of them. And all of them are being exploited. So you have to protect all of your all of your devices. You have to protect your proxy, you have to protect your yeah, gateways, you have to patch them, you have to patch your media servers, you have to take care of the phones and the customers with the access and so on. And after some time, this gets impossible. It's impossible to protect all the assets. It's impossible to patch all of this. If you have 10, 12, maybe 100 gateways, it's impossible to patch each one. You cannot disrupt your approach. Then after some time, you get to the point that this is not, this is not feasible. 
So you have to put something in between. So you can have now an open SIP as an inbound and outbound proxy, but for valid IP address and all of your infrastructure behind these, this valid IP address. So you can hide completely your infrastructure using open SIPs. In this case, all of your all of your all of your components are behind that, behind the internet, with an invalid IP address. This is much, much harder to access. And this is, yeah, for the new projects, most of them we have to deliver in this way. It's much safer than the other way. You can do this in two ways. You can buy an SPC or you can use open SIPs to do it. There is 120,000 reasons to use open SIPs in front of the in front of this infrastructure. Right? So let's see how it works. How can we use open SIPs to build a solution to to hide our our network behind open SIPs? Let's just split the problem. I will split this problem in two, two parts. The first part is SIP, the second part is RT. So let's handle SIP first. SIP is actually the protocol with a problem with that. <coughs> right? So because you have in the net, in, in the SIP headers, you have the addresses. You have layer 3 information in a layer 7 or layer 6. So that's the problem. And this is the one we have to handle. So, okay, let's put the, let's simply set the outbound proxy in the client with this, this address. You can send an invite from the outbound users to inbound users. So, to receive calls is actually very simple. Right, put the, put the system as an outbound proxy, put two cards, put the system as a multi-helmet system, and you can send calls. I have, we'll put the health header, and it works like a charm. The problem starts to happen when you have clients behind us. So I have a phone here, sorry about this, I changed it with clients. I have a client be on the, on the valid, on the public internet, and I have my infrastructure on the private internet. And now I need to, to register this client. So I need a transparent proxy to register this client to the first proxy. Right? No problem. Send, send the register there. Right? It will register. Yeah. It will register here in the first proxy. No problem. The problem is when you send a call to this, to this user that is registered, this user will send this invite, let's suppose, you are calling this phone from a user inside the network, right? And you, you haven't done, you didn't have done anything here. It will have this valid IP address, right? When you send a call here, it will not pass through the, to the inbound address because in the registration, you don't have the intermediate system in the middle, right? So what we have to do to make this thing work uh, how to force the delivery over the outbound proxy? Which, ad which address do we have on the to pay? When, we, when you register this phone to this proxy, you're going, you will have the, the IP address 200, 200, 1, 1, but no information about the, about the intermediate proxies. There is a module on OpenSIPs uh, called PATH. The path module allows you to include this path information on registration. So you can add the path header on the on your open SIPs in the beginning here, right? And it will save this information, this path information on your proxy. This is actually the trick to have open SIPs in the world. Right? And when you have the path in the border, it will save this information here on the user location. Then when you call up your customer, it will send through the inbound proxy back to you. And then it doesn't matter if the user is inside or outside of the, of the SPC, it will really handle exactly the same. This is a trick for us. Let's suppose that you don't have your proxy is not OpenSIPs is free switch or asterisk, or a little balancing asterisk or 
free switch set, right? The problem is uh, the path module exists on OpenSIF since since forever. <laughs> I don't remember when it was included, but it, it exists since forever. For for asterisk, only the version 12 has the support of that. Right? There are some patches for the asterisk 108. And you can actually trick asterisk to insert it in the address if you don't have that support. Free switch, yes, you, if you already have to, it's using the FS, FS there's, a, there's a module in free switch to use this. So this allows you to have open sips in front of the uh, in front of the of your open sips or your free switch. So you can have a load balancer, you can have whatever you want you want with open sips and then use it as a, an SPC. Right? So this is the add path. So in this box, we have some comments like add path or add path receiving. To include this headers to inform your registration server, which which was the path for the user. So this is the way we solve the SIP part of the challenge. The second part are here the path headers. So the path is included in the in the SIP header. I use also another SIP header called the X source unit where I send some information off the original address. Let's suppose you're blacklisting IP addresses. You don't have the address that you're going to receive on the on your central proxy is the address of the inbound of that proxy. Right? So if you want to know the original IP address, you have to include it on the on an extra header and read this information. It. What else? Solving the RTP problem. The way to solve, there are actually more than one way to, to solve the RTP problem. The first implementation we did with it using RTP proxy in bridge mode. Is there anyone here using RTP proxy in bridge mode? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. So you have one card in one side and another card in the other side. And then any RTP is force it through this, this internet interface to the other internet interface. And you bridge, using RTP proxy, you bridge this, uh, this one. The RTP for a call, having a single point of entry on the RTP. If you, you can also use contract here to open and close the RTP ports if you want, to create a pin drop whole file. Right, so that's the way to solve. But there's another way. We, can, we actually don't need the, the RTP proxy virtual. We can use simple RTP proxy the other stuff. Right? You can use NAT here to force, use a static NAT to the RTP proxy. And when you're sending a call to the valid IP address, send the, send the external address instead of the internal address. So you don't actually have to, to use RTP proxy. So there's no clarity. So you use the RTP proxy inside the network and, and do a static net to this box. And you can also solve it. It's more scalable. But most of the times, there's an advantage of RTP proxy in virtual. It's more transparent. But you can also use the RTP proxy inside instead of using the RTP proxy. Okay, we have solved part of the problem, but we still have a, a security gap. Okay, now all my servers are protected. We have our proxy and gateways behind behind a, a single entry point. In this single entry point, we can we can validate uh, headers. We can use what we call protocol signature protection to detect some of the attacks. And we can we can help a lot. To but there's a still a big problem. Lots of times we have phones or customer PBXs happening. Right? So, okay, my customer was happy. I have a customer who was using Elastics 2.10 or 2. Dot, something that is highly vulnerable, and he was happy. And now we have a challenge here because the IP address is authorized. The digest of education 
is okay. The user has credit, everything is okay. <coughs> How do we detect now that this is a fraud? So no solution is complete without an anti-fraud. So we have, for this, for this case, we need to have something like an anti-fraud solution. We need to have something that protects our system from fraud problems because we cannot protect it directly. So the problem with customers being hacked. Traffic is authenticated, no failed attempts. So failure to run does not help. Does not help on anything here. Uh, user agent from user, everything seems okay. All normal security procedures pass. So whenever a customer is hacked, it's a problem for the provider. And in this case, we can apply an anti-fraud system. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't miss the joke. There, there was a <laughs> There was a commercial on the TV yesterday, and I couldn't have missed the, the anti-fraud solution. So we can anti-fraud systems are becoming mandatory. So you can have simple things like prepaid accounts where you can limit the losses. Very hard to enforce for some clients. Ask a call center to have a prepaid account, and you're going to see that it's really, really hard. Right. Codas, you can admit the losses, but you have to manage. When you have lots and lots of users, it's hard to manage. So we have created a solution where you can create a profile for, for users. And along with profiles, you have blacklists. So we have three blacklists. Signature blacklists, right? So we search for the header for signatures. There are 20 signatures that are present in 99.9% of the accounts. So 99.9 .9 can be simply discarded before they start. Right? Then we have the, the blacklist for IP addresses and dial -in numbers. The dial numbers are close to 50,000. Right? And IP addresses is not big, it's about 2,000. 2000 a little more than 2,000 IP addresses in the blacklist. And here, what we have is we allow outbound calls to a specific country. So for each user, I can go there and say, this user can call to which, uh, which countries this user is allowed to call to, and which countries they are allowed to call from using GeoIP location. Right, so using GeoIP location, I can say, I, I don't have customers in the US, I, don't, I want to receive calls only from the US. So, 99.9% were <laughs> simply thrown away using signature. Now with inbound, inbound countries and outbound countries, we can decrease these two a lot less, right? And now, and finally, we have this policy. So, we define what is off hours, what are off, are off hours you can put, holidays, whatever you want here, right? And then we allow how many calls, how many simultaneous calls we are going to allow on working hours, uh, what's the quota of the number of calls in the day on, on the working hours, what are the number of calls that I'm going to allow off hours? So in the weekends, one simultaneous call is the maximum that you can do. Try the second one if you, you're going to receive it. So, and at midnight of Friday, when the, when the hacker tries to attempt uh, uh, hacking on our PDX, he puts it 30 calls, 30 or 60 simultaneous calls. You're going to be alerted. Uh, alerted and the, the guy will block it right away. Right? And quota of hours, how many, uh, how many calls in 24 hours you're going to allow. So if you're on a Saturday, they can try one, they can try two, on the third, it's good. Right, so these are the policies that you can apply. And the good thing here is you can apply these policies using a mechanism called the seed rate rack. So actually we have a server, a seed rate rack server. So you can apply this to asterisk, twist switch, or open source. So you can apply to your customers, you can apply to your own well, to your own soft switch. It's a SaaS software as a service as we connected to the SPC or the switch or passwords. I can show you how it works for it. So we have the TFPS, you can go there if you want to create an account. 
what they are create, and you can create your own policies. We have something on the TFPS that's called collaborative protection. What is collaborative protection? If you are hacked, the other guy will have access to this blacklist in real time. For some, for some things like IPs, it will insert the the IP on the on the center. Right? Blacklists of IP, dialed numbers, and protocol signatures, policies, and the mechanism is the SIP record. Why SIP record? SIP record is very fast. It's based on UDP. It's not based on HTTP or REST or SOAP or something that needs connection. So you can run 200 calls per second, 200 checks per second easily in a red track server. Right now, in Brazil, this server does the redirect for local number portability and fraud detection at the same time. And it receives, one of the servers receives more than 200 calls per second, mainly for local number portability. Another interesting thing about using the SIP redirect mechanism is you don't need to send all your traffic to the, to the fraud detection, right? You don't need to send a call that costs one cent of a dollar to fraud protection. Then probably no one, no one will, is going to fraud a one, one, uh, one, cent of call, one cent call. But for a seven dollar call to some item, it makes a lot of sense to, to send this call to the fraud protection. So you can choose what do you want to protect, what type of calls do you want to protect. In OpenSIP, sorry, the code is a bit, but it can be implemented on any SIP server. You send a call using normal. Yeah. It's like sending a call to a flight provider. You have to append some headers. I want to know the user agent received it. I want to know the number of simultaneous calls. I want to know the number of the source ID received. And you send this to the FPS hosted. And then in the failure route, I will check the address and anything with A starting with A00 is approved and you can send ahead. Right, you can restore the original URI and send ahead. Anything else, you simply send 403 from there. So it's an anti fraud system that can be applied to any other system. It does not need to be uh, applied to. Could you go back to the previous please? Yes. Thanks. If you're going to read this, I save the original number, put the TL reply one. If the method is invited, I'm sending the TL favorite 5, and then I'm sending this to the TFPS server. Create a dialog here. Okay, I could have created this dialog for And I set the VLG profile, so I'm counting the calls sent to the, F, to the FPS. And when I append pen, these headers, I could have appended a single header. Right now I'm appending three headers. I'm sending the simultaneous calls here on this, on this additional header. And when I I send this ahead to the redirect server, and when I receive a response to 302, I check the status of 302, get the redirects, and then I know if it starts with A00, it's approved. If it starts with R something, I can actually return the code why the call was, was rejected. Right? You can simply say, so you, you're basically using 302 like a service call. Yeah. Right? It's like it's sort of an HTTP call or a CP call, you just using 302. Yes, I'm simply using redirect as a, the same way we, we go to the redirect to redirect for local number portability. Okay. It's the same principle, but okay. now apply it to infrared detection. So that redirect server goes to the database and checks the database. Yes, I okay. So in this way, you distribute it, but then you don't need to keep it individually on every server. Yes. Okay. And the good thing is, how this, how this, Lists are created. How do we create the lists? We have web lists, there were buttons. We have some lists that came from GSM, the association. They have some public DNS for data number lists. IP address is taken from the honeypots. And now, most of the others are taken in a collaborative way. If one user is using, it's feeding the database for the others. Right? And it's pluggable. You can plug on any open system. Right? You don't need to have your own, you don't need to create your own uh, 
12 points. It's simply global. And it's global for asterisk and it's global for full search. Because redirect exists on for any. So it's for sure. Okay, so what's next? We are working on this, this SVC to support authentic call transfers using <coughs> back-to-back iterative module of open source. Actually, we did some tests on the on last week. We got to make attended transfers using back-to-back -back iterations. Right? We need to do some cleaning on the thing because it's a still very little complex and support for call to call. What do we want is to use hosted PDX completely in open SIPs and do not rely on any other system to for refers and and replace headers. And in, on the TFPS, we are integrating a security scan. So each user of the, the system will receive a daily scan to check for vulnerabilities to make sure that no one has changed the file <coughs> on that and an exposure on the system. That's it. We can try fast and unpainful, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> if you have questions, please. You mentioned that's a UDP and it doesn't require a connection. UDP does not require a connection. Ah, obviously, you, have, you need to have an internet connection. <laughs> no, it's, it's not connecting. It's not connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but the connection doesn't say that you still have to yeah. connect, right? You need you a have connect to accept the connection, right? Yeah. But you, if, you have a, if you have TCP, you have to send um, what's the name? request. No, it's not a request. You have to start a connection. So you have to send for a connection if you use TCP. You still have to accept the connection. You have to do a, yeah, you have to do a three-way handshake to, to establish a connection and then start to, to send. And you will do it. Like, with a sort of like 2008. Let me put in another one. With seed redirect, I can handle 500 calls per second going to the portability. But it's the local number for the building that's a database of 15 million numbers. But you still have to do lookup on the redirect server, right? You still need to go to the databases. No, okay, no problem. But that's going to be, you know, how many redirect servers do you have? Only one? Sorry? How many redirect servers do you have? Only one? No, we have we have two redirect two servers. servers. For load balancing, it's not Okay. Right? For load balancing and failover. But I don't even know. It's, it's really fast. How is, uh, you send you 1,000 calls per second? If you send me 1,000 calls per second, I will need to apply <laughs> more. I will need to load balance. To be, to be honest, I'll have to put CP and check how many I can get. But I can I can tell you, with HTTP, because we, are, we also have HTTP for local member portability, right? We cannot get more than 30 to 40 calls per second compared to 500 in a UDP connection using CP. Sigma Direct is really, really fast. You, you receive the, the answer in less than two, two, three minutes. It's, it's UDP. UDP is much, much faster than anything that you can do with TCP. HTTP servers are slow. It does, doesn't matter what. If you're going to use a curl, it will never give you the, the performance of a redirect. But what if you need to do a REST call in your redirect server? Your redirect server will be slow. So. Yes, it's true. So, so you keep everything in cache in memory, or like you use non cache or redis kind of? I mean, you depends. It depends on the for the prefixes database we have cache. For the portability database, no, it's too big to cache in the you can call like the distributed cache now, right? I mean, yeah. you, you can you use know, whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to the database, all right? And the database has a very efficient cache. It's read only, so I don't have any social so It's really, it's, it really it's performs. It really performs well. Right now, I don't have any problem with my function. It is anymore. Most of the, if you go to my single, I'm going to see 99% of the time it's not the AC cache. Right, so. You don't need to do anything so fancy to process a large Yeah, it's, I, I think it's the, the most important thing is the risk client. And the reason is like 
I mean, if data is yours, of course you could put somewhere that's classical and inconvenient. But the best client, why you use, like, for example, if you need to go check a person's, for example, social security number before you're being aroused, or if you need to go check a criminal number before you're being aroused, you have to do the rest of it. Right, right. I mean, right. In this case, you do the greaser here. Right, it's not really routing anymore. It's not really fast. $25,000 cost per second value. It's getting more complicated. We have yeah, to go with the track. But what do you think? For what we have shown in terms of fraud protection, right. I have all the databases. I, need, I don't need to get on the main thing. But you do else. Think, when, when someone starts a call, let's suppose that a PDX was, was hacked. The user is OK. It's authenticated. It's from the right IP. Everything is correct. The only thing that you, you don't have is you don't know the user agent of the user of the that PDX and with the FTS you can. Or you can go back to the user just did you just call us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> it, it it was funny. I was in my brother's house in Sarah's and I was chatting with someone, someone that I didn't know, the guy from the insurance. And he asked me, What do you do now? Do I work with telephony. He said, yeah, telephony is being a mess for me. He said, why? No, we got a $70,000 bill from the operator. And I said, wow. No, the guy said that it was because our, our administrator kept the password in the, in the screen and someone stole the password. He said, come on, guys. There's a guy in Egypt trying to hack all the PBXs in the world. Right, so probably someone hacked your PBXs. And it, it was a hosted provider. Technically, they are provide a contester bill because this is it, it, it's the responsibility of the provider to, to provide security. It was, it was not the password on your on your screen. I have I have a few honeypots working on. They try everything. They used to try with sit now they are trying really hard on HTTP. They check every day for Vichy Dial, STP, all these open source packages. We have skins every day in the infrastructure. The, there are four, I'll show this on the, on the Blue Call presentation. There are four, four hacking attempts that I can see almost every day. Two on the Elastics, the VTiger vulnerability, the copy page number. The copy page I will show the display being used just to exemplify on the Blue Call. There's another one on the PHP. There is a PHP injection. And the fourth one. I don't remember. No. This this are they are really trying sending the sending the packet ready to to grab the information, to grab the the user or to get root access to the to the system. And everything. Yeah, so the chance for your customers to be hacked if they are using Elastic or anything based on PHP is very, very high. And that's the problem that I'm seeing now in web providers. They are protected, but their customers are they are setting up. Okay, guys. I think. Thank you.